Welcome to the History Connection Podcast, where we discuss different aspects of history with one main idea. If you do not know your history, you will not know your future. I'm Michael Musangu, and I'm a student at the University of Portland that studies biology and I minor in history. Today, in the inaugural episode of our podcast, we, will go- we are going to be discussing one of my favorite personal topics. And this topic is really amazing, and I've been really excited to talk about it because there are so many different facets and there's so much content involved with it. Honestly, it's amazing just to know that there is so much to say, and I'm really excited to get started. Our topic today will be on Napoleon Bonaparte. That's right. From his downrise to from his uprise to his downfall. And along with this, we will have one main encompassing question that we'll be discussing the whole term of this po- or for the whole term of these few, first few episodes. And that question will be, what makes a person the national citizen of the country that they live in? Now, this question may sound a bit weird, but I hope that we'll be able to dissect it a bit as we go through this podcast today. There are a few different main t- uh, questions and topics that we will be going through, and by the end of this podcast, you will be able to learn about who Napoleon was and who he really was. Was he really as power-hungry as people claim he was? And we will also learn a bit of the historical context surrounding his life, the geopolitical situation, and the different things that made um his military rise, what it was, the whole situation surrounding it, and what changed Napoleon to become the man that we know him as in infamous history. I encourage you, if you're listening today, to take some notes, maybe so that you can um, catalog some of the information that you find interesting, and maybe jot down some different ideas that you may want to research in detail. I will also be going over certain primary sources, so if there are any sources that you have questions of, feel free to check also in the show notes, and we'll be going into full detail. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Napoleon Bonaparte. Hi, I'm Michael Musangu, and this is the History Connection Podcast. So to start off, we will be discussing the who, what, when, where, why, and how of what makes our topic exactly what it is on this podcast today. So Napoleon, to start off, he was a man that was born on August 15th, 1789 to Carlo and Maria Letizia Bonaparte. Now, what is amazing about Napoleon is that he was actually born a French citizen. Most people don't realize this. Uh, Most people just attribute the Italian roots he had to the fact that he was an Italian citizen. This is simply not true. He was born a French citizen. And this happened due to the fact that Genoa, which was the Italian state that actually gave up the island of Corsica to France in the Treaty of Versailles in 1768, about one year earlier, made all the citizens that were on the island of Corsica French at this time period. Let's delve a little bit back into the history behind this. So, Corsica itself was an island that was owned by Genoa, uh, which was a city-state, uh, or a state, I should say, an Italian state during this time period. From about 1284, Corsica was under Genoese rule. Now, by the beginning of the se- early 18th century, or the 1700s, Corsica had begun to develop their own identity, we shall say. They started to have a language similar to the Italian spoken by uh, Tuscany. That's the origin of the modern Italian that most people know today. And this identity was very similar to the Italians that we know today. And Genoa was the island that owned them at the time period. They basically remained free, even though they were under Genoese, you know, survey surveillance until the seven, early 1700s but the corsican revolution started to force the corsican revolutionaries to push for independence but this didn't really work in fact one of the main leaders in this push for independence was actually um, named Jacinto Paoli this man is actually who started the early Corsican Revolution for Independence, and throughout these struggles that were going on in this time period, and um, at the late 1720s, they really tried to push for this 
idea of independence as the concept of the Enlightenment was starting to become a very prominent and real thing during this time period. Unfortunately, this didn't really work out. So what happened is that Corsica really had this lull in, in, in a push for independence. But there was this idea that they really wanted to be independent and independent from Genoese rule during this time period where Italy was actually divided into a bunch of states. During this time period, actually, Italy was not a unified Italy, but they were actually divided into different states. For example, there were states like Genoa or or Sardinia or Venice and or the Papal States. But it wasn't until 1861 that they all became one whole unified kingdom. So during this time period, after the failed Genoese, uh, or after the failed Corsican push for independence, it wasn't until about 1755 that Corsica really had a breakthrough, and this was through the help of Pascal Paoli. Paoli was a successful revolutionary that was born around the time of 1725, and he led a successful revolution against the Genoese, starting in 1755. Actually, July 13th was the time that he started this revolution, and this is what is considered the Independence Day for the Corsicans today. When this revolution happened, he literally revolutionized and changed Corsica into a modern uh, state that we know it as today or a modern island or, or economy that we know it as today. He literally brought an independence to Corsica that we've never known, where it had a justice system, a currency. It even had a, the one island's university that is well known today, and it even had their own standing army. Now, these same ideas of independence that were present uh, present and enlightenment ideas and concepts that were also present that Voltaire and even Rousseau spoke of, it it really helped people understand that this idea for independence was a needed thing and, and something that was valid for the people to achieve. Thus, it got to a point where during the period after the war revolution had started against Genoa, that Genoa decided that this was too much of a thing to handle. So they decided in 1768 to offer the island to France in what was called the Treaty of Versailles. Not the Treaty of Versailles that actually ended the American Revolution that was completely different that happened in 1783, but we're talking the Treaty of Versailles of 1768. This Treaty of Versailles actually made Corsica French. This happened on May 15th, 1768, and this made Corsica French. All the citizens that actually spoke Corsican, which was a, which is basically an Italian derivative of the language, actually became French, and this is actually what made Corsica, Fra Corsica French. That said, he eventually was defeated at the Battle of Ponte Novo on the 8th of May, 1769. So this ended Pascal Paoli's rise and, 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 and push for independence. Now, Pascal Paoli is the son of Jacinto Paoli. I must definitely get this straight because these two were definitely connected because Jacinto Paoli was the one who really started this idea for independence and started the the push for independence and what made Corsica a free state. But this didn't really happen during his time period because the skirmishes kept getting squashed. So now that we have this all background all aside, now what does this have to do with Napoleon? Well, when Napoleon was born, Napoleon was born a French citizen. And as we see that Napoleon was a French citizen, as a child, you know, that Napoleon wasn't a very amiable kid, you know? He wasn't that kid that was, you know, all lucky, all go lucky and really friendly or anything. He was really a kid that was very moody, actually, quite a moody kid. And we are going to be discussing some of these sources here in a bit, but we'll go a little bit into some of the things that people noticed in him as a kid and, and the way he acted and his mannerisms to understand truly the person he was. In fact... Napoleon actually happened to be the favorite kid of his father. Napoleon's parents, um, I believe they had 12 children. Only eight of them survived to adulthood. Napoleon was the third kid out of uh, the third kid out of the four that were born at the time. And <clears throat> he was the first surviving male, I believe. So now some of the history that I'll be quoting or some of the sourcing that I'll be quoting will come from the book the History of Napoleon Bonaparte by John S. C. Abbott. Now, some of these points that I'm going to be displaying are some of the facts that are just known about Napoleon in general. 
first of all, he was the favorite kid of his father. That is just something that was well known by historians as well. He actually sat on the knee of his father and, and would recite the bloody battles in which Corsica compel, was, and I quote, compelled to yield to the victorious French, unquote. You know, and this is on page 21, by the way. And, 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 and Napoleon, during this time period, you know, he, I mean, he grew up speaking about the revolutionaries that went before him, the, the people that fought for independence, that brought them the liberty that they are living on, you know? And, and another thing that we must note, uh, again, on page 21, I quote, Napoleon hated the French. This is something that we must note. Napoleon did not grow up loving the French society. I mean, you grow up in a culture where you are you are born speaking Italian. You are you have an Italian culture. You are living an Italian culture. Your your life, your mannerisms, everything you do, your your thought process is all Italian. But you were taken over by the French because the 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 state that owned you would not let you be free. And thus, they gave you over to the French because they didn't want to deal with your skirmishes anymore. The mindset of the people and the revolutionary mindset of the people of this time were very, very harsh towards the French. And in fact, they didn't like the French very much at all. So going through his childhood, Napoleon was eventually accepted at, um, into the French military school at Brienne, Le Chateau. And this was actually due to a close friend of the, Napo of the Bonaparte family called... Count Marbeuf. Marbeuf. The governor of Corsica, as he was appointed as um, Count Marbeuf, who was the governor of, Corsin, of Corsica as he was appointed by the French court at Paris. Now, he was brought to this French military school through the help of Count Marbeuf because Napoleon, as I must explain, he was actually part of minor Corsican nobility. The family itself came from minor nobility of Tuscan origin and came to Corsica from the island uh, from Linguria in the 16th century. Because of this nobility actually this is what led to Napoleon's father Carlo actually going to be a lawyer in the court of Louis the 16th of France in 1778. But anyways Napoleon was accepted into the French military school at Brienne le Chateau by Count Marbeuf, um, by the help of Count Marbeuf, and he actually during his time at the French military school, we start to see some characteristics of this moody, tough, unamiable kid that really had a disdain for the French culture and for the French people. In fact, when he went to this French military school, he was actually regarded as a foreigner because he spoke Italian. In fact, Napoleon had to go to school and learn French, you know, at the same time. In fact, even in his adult years, he spoke French with an Italian accent, a strong Italian Corsican accent. And, and, and while Napoleon was going through his years at the schooling, uh, I mean, a lot of kids really didn't like him. In fact, I will quote a couple of quotations here that will help us see some of the reasons why maybe some people wouldn't have liked him. For example, here on page 23, it is said that the young nobleman, taunted Napoleon with being the son of a Corsican lawyer. And I think this is one thing that we must note. During this time, prestige and, and money and, and nobility w was everything. You, we must understand, if you're going to a school of nobility where only nobles go, if you need help to get there, I mean, how rich are you then, you know? Because only the rich of the rich went there. Only the top, the high class really went there. So if you needed help, going there you know how is that going how is that beneficial how is how is that really riches how is that showing your class and looking at this everything was made fun of especially for napoleon the way he dressed how much money he didn't have as i mentioned before and and during his and during you know certain times when he was angry he was quoted as saying i hate those french and i will do everything I will do them all the mischief in my power. I'm trying to quote this correctly. I will do them all the mischief in my power. So one must understand that Napoleon himself really had a disdain for the French as a young kid. I mean, being made fun of, he, he, he didn't even speak the language very well. He really had to learn it as he was going through schooling. 
But one thing we must note, Napoleon was a very good student. One thing we must note is that Napoleon was a really bright student. And I must repeat this again because this is something that people really need to understand in the development of the character of Napoleon himself. Now, one thing I will quote here is that as he was a bright student, he was so distinguished, actually, that his peers actually had to acknowledge this. Even though they didn't like him, they had to literally acknowledge, okay, look, this guy, we may not like him, but this guy is really smart. In fact, he was so distinguished that in maths, history, government, sciences, he would literally devour all his studies in these books. He would literally get to a point where he was a recluse in the library. He would avoid play recess. Like imagine a kid at like 10 years old avoiding recess because you want to read and, and study and learn about history and science. It just doesn't compute at that age. Literally every hour of leisure that he had would be spent in the library pouring himself into these books and understanding the world around him, putting into context the things that make the world what it is. And it's because of this he became a highly distinguished scholar at a very, very young age. In fact, he didn't actually have a lot of ideas or or I guess con or I guess future ideas of military conquest at the time. I mean, at 10 years old, you are only, you know, thinking about recess or a normal kid would be thinking about recess and, and playing and, and doing sort, sorts of things like that. And of course, you have the scholars, you know, that maybe still like to read or you have, may have bookworms, but they still like recess. But Napoleon was a different type of kid. He literally spent his time in the library in his free time. He never even actually went to recess that often. But when he did, the the, the students had to realize that this person was a different kid. One other thing I must note is that France at this time in, um, was really a nation that had denounced Christianity, that has really moved away from the Christian values that had been going around the world at this time. In fact, um, as religion and, and, and different studies of scripture and the Bible are taught in school during this time period, there was a lot that... Christianity wasn't really part of Napoleon's education. And we must note that this actually is something to keep track of here. Religion and, and, and Christianity and all these things wasn't really part of Napoleon's education, which is, I think, another thing that is key to understanding his character in his development leading up to the man that he eventually became. All right, now that we've gone through some of really... Napoleon's schooling and, and understanding a portion of his early childhood, I want to move forward now into more of what m makes the political development of who Napoleon was exactly what made him who he was. Now, um, eventually during one of his, um, I should say, off seasons or breaks during school, he actually went back to Corsica. And this is where he actually crossed Paoli. Now, if we remember, uh, Pascal Paoli is the great Corsican revolutionary who really led and, and, and fought for the independence of Corsica, the island at the time. And actually, they did eventually go and, and they met and they had a really nice meeting. And Paoli really took Napoleon under his wing. After a very successful summer with him and all this stuff, they really became actually very close friends. And this is at a young age, you know, Napoleon's, what, 12 years old, you know, when these things are going on. And, and pa Paoli is well into his late 50s, early 60s at this point. But from this point on, Napoleon actually gets promoted to a high-level military school in, uh, near, uh, near Paris. In fact, the process of getting into this military school is so powerful and so hard to get into and just to give you an idea of how hard this was to get into, in order to get into the school at this time, it, only three scholars a year would actually obtain this promotion from his school at Brienne, the Chateau, to get into this military school. In fact, when he got promoted to this military school, 
he actually got uh, promoted to this military school in 1784. And the military school was called École Royale Militaire in Paris. And this was so powerful because he actually finished his two-year course study, study course, I should say, in one year. And he actually was commissioned as a second lieutenant of artillery artillery in, in January 1786 at the age of 16. Now, what's amazing about this is Napoleon's going through this time, right? He gets his promotion into this military school where only three scholars would get in. Well, let's note he gets in, and that's what makes us realize that Napoleon was really an outstanding student to such a point that he beats out literally hundreds of applicants and only three get in. Let's remind, let's remind everyone that Napoleon was not a man of very many means. I mean, of course, he was a minor nobility, but people still made fun of him because he still had to have someone sponsor him, basically, to get to this the first military school he was at. Once he did get in is that he actually was so military minded had such a level of military prowess that people actually started to take note of in fact he spoke to the school governor about getting um about changing the standards of the military preparedness at this school what i mean by this is that he actually spoke to the military uh, to the governor and actually told him you know what we are too pampered if people are actually going to get prepared for the military, we need to actually be exposed like people are in the military when they're going to battles and war and stuff. But the governor of the school, of course, is like shoving us off because, I mean, you're what, you know, 14, 15 year old boy, you know, what do you know? But Napoleon's like, no, this is not how it's supposed to work. <laughs> Now, during this time period at the school, as I mentioned, Napoleon finished his two-year course of study in one year. So you must understand the amount of exertion and work that he actually had to go into. Actually, on page 31 here from the same book of the history of Napoleon, Bonaparte, it says that his, his intense, continuous exertion of mind and body was what was outstanding of a kid at that time. I mean, a 15-year-old kid that is spending hours and hours in the library devoting themselves to studying philosophy, sciences, maths, history, geography, you name it. At such an age, it's just unthinkable. When kids obviously would want to go to parties at this age and go to dances and such, he isn't busy studying. I mean, this is something that is not normal. This is not something that people would think to do at this time period. In fact, this was so prominent that people realized, I mean, he was just literally a recluse, secluding himself from the people, uh, doing things that just don't seem normal. But eventually, it, after finishing this two-year uh, two study course in one year, he graduated and was commissioned in the French military as the second lieutenant of artillery in 1786, January 1786, at the age of 16. Napoleon, after his commission, then serves in the French uh, military for three years, and we run into the juicy stuff, or as I would like to call it, the French Revolution. Now, the French Revolution, obviously, is the pinnacle. This is what really starts Napoleon's career into what makes Napoleon Napoleon as we know him, and and, 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 we, and I had to give sufficient background to help people understand that there is a lot that goes into the development of Napoleon as a person. We already see that he is a very secluded person, very quiet person, really is a, a bookworm, really loved to study, get himself into books. He really had very tough social skills to deal with. But once he graduated and became commissioned as an officer, People started to respect him. His ideas were well developed and he, you start to see him rise to a level of prominence just because of his level of knowledge and the way he carried himself in crowds of people who are well-respected philosophers at this time actually had to deal with. But basically at this point, when the French Revolution started, I mean, the French Revolution is basically patterned after the American Revolution. And it's basically the idea of this get rid of the monarchy and arise to have a self-existing republic. Rep 
republic in this case meaning a country that is run under democracy and without a monarchy. Now, Napoleon at this time was siding with the Jacobins. Now, the Jacobins were a group that basically were against the idea of a monarchy. And there was another group called the Royalists. These were obviously people who were for the monarchy. What we notice here is that the officers, or the military officers, I should say, and higher nobility were the ones who were more royalists, or the ones who were in favor of, of the monarchy and royalty. And the common soldiers and the greater mass of the people who were part of this French Revolution were really more Republican, or part of the Jacobin faction. But what brought Napoleon to this, how do I say, prominence is he started, um, uh, he was attending different parties and different places and, and having different discussions with people, but he was attending this one party and, and, and he heard a person discussing a speech. It was really interesting. They were not really discussing a speech, but rather they were discussing certain ideas going on during the revolution at the time period. And in fact, Napoleon had to chip in and go, hold on, let me give you my ideas here. And let me quote a little bit of it here. It's very fascinating. He goes, uh, it's written here that Napoleon openly avowed his conviction that France, without education and without religion, was not re prepared for the republicanism of the United States. And this is a powerful statement because, again, like I had mentioned, France had really downed this idea of, of Christianity or of any religion being the sole religion or, or being the religion that is taught in schools or anything. It was really the idea of being free and, 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 and away from all different factions of religion and just moving forward into the enlightenment and free thinking and being able to think for yourselves and going away from this idea of having one ruler and having an, a country that is run by the people for the people, right? And let me quote another part here where it is said of Napoleon that Napoleon actually said that the Republican, or not Napoleon himself, but the author here is stating that the Republicanism of the United States is founded on intelligence and, and Christianity and the reverence of law that is so generally prevalent throughout the whole community. So we see here that obviously the French Revolution was very much influenced by the American Revolution. Actually, we can even go a step back here and, and do a little background on this as well. Because the American Revolution was, again, caused by this idea of, you know, I mean, obviously some of the main ideas of the revolution, taxation without representation and, and, and all of these main ideas. But the main idea was really freedom, wanting liberty to be able to do what they felt they were able to do without having to feel like they had to answer to a group of people that were hundreds of miles away to make the decisions for them and to make and to pay taxes to them when they're not even there to understand the struggles that they're going through to understand the economy but yet they are still dictating the lifestyle of the people who are living there in fact when the revolution happened i mean america went through this revolution uh, really just under the idea that they just wanted to be free they didn't care how they had to get it they just went for it and what we notice is that they went through it for a few years and and there had to be a lot of major battles that it took but eventually france was eyeing them because they realized that they couldn't win this by themselves right and 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 they realized that they needed france's help so they actually enlisted france's help and france actually went towards them but we must understand that france and england have also had this history of also vying at each other and going against each other back and forth. I mean, this has gone throughout a lot of time. Even at the beginning of the 18th century, we see with the War of Spanish Succession as well that France also had butting heads with, uh, with a bunch of other countries in Europe. It's mainly Spain, or not really Spain, but with other countries because of what Spain had to do to replace their own monarch. Um, just a quick background on this as well. Uh, the War of Spanish Succession had to do with the fact that Spain, their monarch, uh, Charles II, had passed away. Thus, they had to find another monarch to go and take their throne. So what they did is that in 
Charles II's will, he said that Philip of Anjou, who was under Louis XIV, or the Sun King of France, was going to come and take his throne. Now, obviously, all the Allied nations, the war, uh, or the coalition, as they were called, of Austria and some other nations, they were like, this will make literally Spain and France so powerful and controlling so many things, we can't let this happen. So basically, the War of Spanish Succession happened. So England and France have always had this back and forth for many years. Now, this episode is not really about the War of Spanish Succession. It's more about Napoleon and the history between France and Corsica and what brought this to be what it was. So moving forward, um, with the American Revolution, once France and America became allies, this again brought issues with England into play because America, uh, I mean, I shouldn't say America, but France really bankrupted themselves, helping America out and, and of course, living the lavish lifestyle that, you know, Mar Marie Antoinette and, and Louis XVI lived. I mean, it, it made life very hard. And thus, you know, the poor in France were very poor. They were in poverty and the nobles were very rich and they were living their lives. They were living the life, you know. And it got to a point where the people said, this is enough, just like America did. America said, this is enough. They went, they won, and they literally became an independent country, an independent republic to go for the ideals of life, liberty, and happiness, the pursuit of life, liberty, and happiness. And now France has decided we're going to do the same thing. And this started actually with Bastille Day. Which actually start, which actually happened on July fourteenth, seventeen eighty nine. This is really what is the start of the French Revolution. And when this happened, this led to the push and pull between what were the what were the Jacobins and the Royalists for the monarchy and against the monarchy. Now, moving forward into this, I now want to discuss a little more. Some of the ideas that Napoleon had because of because of this war and what this led him to do. So with the war starting, actually, for the first few years, he wasn't really active in it, actually, which is quite interesting. That is probably a whole topic within itself. But actually, um, the first few years, you know, after his commission, he really didn't do much in the war. It was really about 1793 that he actually went back to Corsica. He actually went back and took a break from the military. He went there on like hiatus, basically. Like he went to take a nice extended break, nice vacation, we should call it. So he said, I'm going to go back. This is what I'm going to do. So he goes back to the island and he goes back and he meets his old friend Paoli. Now, the funny thing about Paoli is that while Napoleon was in France and before he came back, Paoli basically was recognizing one thing. We do not want to be... I mean, he basically came to the idea that we do not want to be directly involved with the things going on in France. But we also realized this is our opportunity to be independent from France. So they're like, or not so they're like, rather Paoli was like, okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to go talk to the British because Paoli was actually really good friends with the British because actually after the revolution that he started for Corsican independence in 1755, he was actually exiled to Britain um, and later on was actually allowed to go back as, um, as uh, time permitted. But anyways, as Paoli was and Napoleon actually met again on the island, Paoli was in the process of actually surrendering Corsica to Britain and was going to allow Corsica to be under Britain or under British rule for a few years in the hopes that they could actually be autonomous and actually be able to do their own things and not be under French influence or French rule. But let's let's understand that Napoleon looking at this is like, what are you doing? You are a revolutionary and you're literally surrendering us to the British. In fact, what Poli was really trying to do here is that he was arguing that the French were really lost. I mean, obviously, they're going through their own war, their own struggles for independence, and Corsica needs to be returned to, and I quote, reason and to law. And this is why 
Paoli made the decisions he did. But Napoleon argued, well, you don't even have the culture. You guys don't even have the same customs, uh, language, the concepts, values that the English do. Thus, you should not make this move. But the problem is, is Poli already made this move. He was already in the process of doing it. It was just a matter of when the British would land. And now, let's look now back at the British. The British are like, okay, well, the French are obviously going through turmoil. And we need a way to have a close outpost to France. So they realize if we have Corsica which is not very far from France itself, then we will go ahead and we will be able to, you know, mount an attack on France. And they realized it was a French port at Toulon, which actually was um, weakened. And they were like, this is our opportunity to take it. So they decided we're going to take Poli up on his offer. We will transfer Corsica to England. And thus, we will go ahead and make our moves on f the French while they are weak. And thus, the island was surrendered to the English. And actually, George, King George III actually became their monarch from 1794 to 1796. The first and only monarch of the island of Corsica. What's amazing here is that even with King George as the monarch, they really had what was considered the best democratic republic that they could have had at the time, you know? Even though King George was still the monarch, they still had, you know, a parliament and they still had a prime minister that, that acted and they still had a, um, a viceroy who really acted, or a count viceroy, I should say, who really acted in King George III's interest as King George III was very occupied with the issue going on with France at the time as they were having their own uh, war at the time. Thus, this allowed for um, Paoli to have a lot of influence in the place that, or in, in Corsica, in his place that he is being a Corsican revolutionary that everyone knows and respects a lot. Napoleon and his family actually escape from the island once he realizes that Poli was serious and Poli once again fled or flees to England and Napoleon or Corsica becomes an English colony or an English island. Kind of known, it was actually known, I believe, as Little Gibraltar, which is quite interesting, but this only lasted for two years. This arrangement didn't last very long, and actually, in fact, um, a general uprising took place um, against Napoleon, which is actually what brought, which is actually what kicked him out of the island. In fact, he decided it wasn't safe for his family to remain there. So they, this general uprising that was against him for not really siding with Paoli and 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 allowing him to allow the English to come on and to take rule, even though. Napoleon and Napoleon were, or Napoleon and Paoli were friends. Napoleon thought that these ideas that he had were not really correct, in that the English didn't really have similar culture as the French, and even not that as the Italians. Because I mean, Corsica, the island itself, they still spoke Corsican, which is basically Italian, and and he really thought it was a mistake. And thus, once the general uprising occurred, he decided this was their time to leave. So he left the island with his family in 1794, upon Napoleon's leaving of the island of Corsica in 1793. He actually uh, becomes artillery commander during the French Reign of Terror in 1794, a year later. And from this point on, we are going to actually discuss the War of the First Coalition through the War of the Seventh Coalition. We're going to discuss all of this in the next episode. Thank you for listening today, and I'm Michael Musangu. I hope that this was very informative and that it helped you to see a little more into the character of who Napoleon was and what made him into the character that he was and, and how he acted. In fact, we're going to actually have a guest speaker next week, and we'll be going into this a little more as we will delve into the characteristics of, of the French Reign of Terror and eventually 
Napoleon actually crowning himself as emperor and moving forward into the War of the Coalitions. This is very pinnacle in the development of the character of Napoleon. I really hope that you all enjoyed this, and I, I, I hope to see you next time on the History Connection podcast. Thanks for listening.